Hello everyone, welcome to our latest Facebook Live. Um, this morning I'm here with Graham Allen, who used to be an MP and chair of the um, Political and Constitutional Reform Committee, uh, to talk about a written constitution, because obviously a written constitution is one of the things that Unlock Democracy ca campaigns for, but people often come to us with questions about why we think it's a good idea, what it is, and I thought Graham would be an excellent person to explore that with me. Thank you, that was very flattering. And <laughs> here's one that we prepared earlier. Uh, which if you have a look on uh, Twitter, uh, Graham Allen MPX, uh, you'll be able to uh, find a link through to have a look at that and you can uh, pick the bits and pieces out of there that you would like. And in essence, if I can just give you a page reference a little later, um, you don't have to read the whole of that because it is rather thick. But what we did was put this together with a lot of help, not least from Unlock Democracy, but um, using Professor Robert Blackburn and Andrew Blick at King's College. And they have created in one document with the select committee that I chaired, the Political Constitutional Reform Select Committee, the first ever written constitution, which has got the stamp of Parliament on the front page there. Let me show you again in case you missed it. And so uh, we can use this, uh, whoever, wishes when we've won the argument yep. and we're in the process of winning the argument uh whoever whichever party leader has the vision to say we're gonna do something like this they they don't then say "Ooh, what do we do there's got to be a lot of work mm. we've got the bill in here that is necessary we've got the backup argument we've got the arguments for and against and it's a really good piece of work um, which can be drawn on as a resource so i'd recommend everybody not necessarily to run off all 300 pages, but as I said, when you've got your pencil and paper ready uh, in a few moments, I'll perhaps give you uh, chunks that you can abstract, extract out and have a read. And we can put some links up on the website too and on our Facebook page. But I'm really pleased that you mentioned not just the report, but obviously also the Magna Carta. Mm. The Magna Carta. Yeah. What, one of the things that people often say to us when we start talking about written constitution is, well, you know, we've already got a constitution, we've got the Magna Carta. So why do you think we need something more than the Magna Carta, other than just the fact that obviously that was written in 1215? Well, yes, I think that's the key <laughs> thing. It's 800 years out of date, and uh, although some of the planks of a written constitution can last almost an eternity, um, uh, it's really important that it's, it's of the age mm. in terms of, of the last century and the next century, and discusses things like prime ministers, devolution, the Second Chamber, uh, a Federal Britain, uh, the electoral systems, none of which uh, were in vogue uh, 800 years ago. Uh, Magna Carta was brilliant in its time, mm -hmm. and there are still many things, particularly legal things, which uh, owe their uh, antecedents uh, come from that period. Uh, but uh, we can do better than that now. We're smart enough and bright enough, and uh, build something around a politics that is fit for purpose mm. because certainly throughout my political life uh, things haven't got better in terms of the um, participation levels the understanding the level of education and the commitment of ordinary people to our democratic structure i think you know 50 100 years ago people would have died for our democracy now people are deeply cynical and they don't need to be providing the political classes above all are pushed by us and by ordinary people into creating a new democratic settlement and my goodness do we need it do we need any more evidence that things are going wrong when we or things just don't have the credibility that they should people don't have the faith in the prime minister or politicians that they should because they haven't earned it so let's create a structure that every child at school every school boy and school girl carries in the back pocket a little bit of the rule book that says what mm. happens where and why and then i think people would be much more committed be much more proud of their democracy much more proud of a document and their their nationhood that could be embodied uh, in such a thing but let's ask the people mm. and i think it's we obviously doing enormous tomes to set the agenda to get all the information in one place is very very important it was a first step that's why we did it that way i should by the way 
uh, did I mention the role of King's College? You did. Uh, because I think you it's did, so did, important. Yeah. I would like King's College, uh, Professor Blackburn, Andrew Blick, uh, Vernon Bogdan, and those people. Um, they are willing to pull together a group of academics. They are willing to do that out of the goodness of their own heart. And what we need to do as activists and campaigners about democracy is not now go just to the thing that really turns us on, the, the particular electoral system we'd love to see or how we'd like to reform the Second Chamber, but we need to pool our sovereignty and work together and create a framework in which we can have everybody in the country participating. Mm -hmm. A three-year framework. So uh, I will, if you let me, Alex, move uh, at some point towards the whole concept of a citizens' convention and how we have 10 or 20 million founding fathers and mothers in the UK to create a citizens' convention which will have its recommendations and proposals discussed. That was just what I was going to ask you next because obviously as you, you've already drafted a bill, lots of academics have, for their own interest and academic purposes, written constitutions. Mm. I think Vernon Bogdanall gets his students to do it on a regular basis. It, you know, any group of lawyers could, in theory, draft us a constitution and we would have one. Yep. Um, but one of the important things for not democracy is not just the end result of having a constitution, but the process mm -hmm. of how we get there and the fact that we all have ownership of it. And we've seen in countries like South Africa ha what an amazing process that can be. Yep. And so um, how do you think we should, you know, we've got this great report, but how do you think we should get to a point where we own our constitution? Well, I'll tell you how I think that could happen, but also for a bit of homework, as it were, if people uh, want to run off part of this, um, the whole of the sort of next steps argument. So within this big document, you've got several possibilities for a written constitution, which are in there in great detail. But you've also got a much more sort of political process side that you referred to, uh, Alex. Uh, that begins on page 357. So <laughs> I think you're scaring people with the size, size of that report. <laughs> well, certainly, I wouldn't do it on the printer at home, but um, you can certainly have a look it at it. It doesn't have to be that long. <laughs> and certainly the bits that you run off as hard copy don't have to be that long. But if you want to look at page 357, uh, there's, there's then a whole range of possibilities about how we take this forward. And I think one of the ways in which we take this forward is to initiate a very broad consultation. So let's call it a citizens' convention, which can look at anything that the convention itself, not you and I or politicians decide, but what they decide. So getting that bunch of people into a room, a hundred mm -hmm. people, let's say, backed up by this academic Sherpas, uh, excellent top of the top of the range academics, to write papers as they are asked to do by the by the hundred, but far more importantly, beyond the hundred individuals, if that's the way people want to organise it, the most important part for me would be to go out on using every possible internet, social media device you possibly can to get the commitment. And why is that important? A, because people have lots of different ideas and they should be allowed to participate and have their views heard. But secondly, because if you produce a set of recommendations from a citizens convention on how to change our democracy, mm. one of which I would hope would be that we need a written constitution, but that would be up to the convention. And I'd have to swallow it if it didn't come up with that particular proposal. Um, but to have all those people committed to a set of recommendations which would then hold the politicians to the promise that they'd made to me before the Brexit debacle. What happened was that I went to see all the leaders of the political parties and parliamentary parties and they signed up to put in front of the 2020 Parliament the recommendations of a citizens' convention. Not to vote yes or, or no, not to make a commitment on how they'd vote, but to give a platform mm. and amend and look at and change or delete or endorse entirely uh, whatever the recommendations were that came before the House. So that would be that was going to be 2020. We then had uh, well, was Jeremy Corbyn, Tim Farron in those days, Caroline Lucas, etc. The Conservative that we had, because we obviously couldn't get the Conservative Prime Minister at that point to sign up and say, 
the, the democracy was a, uh, needed in need of a severe repair. Uh, but David Davis, mm. pre-Brexit, was the leading Conservative, and David Davis had, at that point, an honourable record in supporting Parliament as a, as a viable independent institution, which it currently isn't. He now is obviously in government, and Dominic Grieve is the Conservative, mm. uh, leading Conservative that's on, 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 on that letter. So there is a mechanism, there's a way of starting that. In order to do that, we don't, we don't need millions, but we do need a chunk of money, 50 to 100,000 pounds, which frankly, if there aren't people out there who care enough about this to mm. chip in, to, let's say, 10 different groups, 10 wealthy individuals, put 10,000 pounds in a piece, if they aren't out there, if they don't think our democracy is in a crisis, we should all wrap up and go home. Mm. Because if we're still being complacent about the state of our politics when we are held in contempt and our institutions are not fit for purpose, uh, then I think we should pack up and go home. Now, I don't think that's the case, uh, particularly with young people. I think people are thirsty to actually uh, get involved in a process like this, and it wouldn't be politicians. Mm. Politicians should kick it off, in a sense. That's why I got the letter signed by yeah. those people, and they should do the other bookend, as it were, that it does have a, a political outcome. Because what we've done with... Fantastic reports, Power Commission and Charter 88, etc. have done great reports, but they've never had a political outcome yeah. or a political endorsement. The, politi the convention politicians shouldn't be involved in the process in the middle, but they should kick it off, which they're prepared to do, and they should be able to say, we will put this in front of Parliament. If we do that, then I think the millions of people that have been involved in what should be at least a three-year process will hold the politicians to their promises and we will have the next parliament devoted to making our democracy worthy of the name. I mean the commitment you got from the party leaders is obviously crucial because that's it's no longer just us talking in abstract about it would in principle be a good thing to have a constitution or yeah. it would be good to change our politics it's actually this is how we can do it there is a process there is an urgency this is the moment at which we can do it so I think that's really really important and it, I think it would be really helpful if we could just take a few steps back mm. and talk about, for example, like what a written constitution is and why you think it would be a good thing. Um, I think essentially it's because, not least because of our culture, which is uh, class-based and it's quite exclusive, a lot of people don't know the rules. And amazingly, a lot of members of mm. Parliament don't even know the interactions that yeah. do or don't take place. Because they're not written down, many of them are informal, and many of them are made up on the spur of the moment. Now, having been in the House of Commons for 30 years, I've had my fair share of uh, these things. For example, I, I was one of the people who got Parliament to be recalled uh, so we could debate the Iraq war. Um, because there's nothing in the standing orders of the House of Commons or in a constitution that says Parliament should be consulted before we go to war. Oh, don't worry. Uh, the chaps have all agreed that we, we should consult this time. Well, the chaps can also disagree that we should be consulted. <laughs> and in fact, uh, up until the Iraq war, there was no sort of convention that that should happen. Mm. And on the Iraq war, they had to be dragged to Parliament and said, oh, well, it's in the recess, we can't meet. So I, I organised an alternative Parliament, which was due to meet, and only the threat of the BBC covering that alternative Parliament led the then Blair government to um, agree to have the proper parliament recalled. Mm. And then we had the two biggest rebellions within a governing political party in British political history. Still not successful in terms of uh, not following George Bush into Iraq, but nonetheless people were allowed to vocalise and actually make their views known. So that was not written anywhere. That was purely because of organising public pressure. And you can't always do that, and you can't always do it in time either. Mm. Um, War-making war powers when you are involved and when you're not is something else that actually isn't discussed by Parliament, let alone recall mm. to discuss it. Because many members of Parliament don't even understand the concept that Parliament itself is not an independent entity. We talk about parliamentary sovereignty. It's a myth. The truth is that governments set Parliament's agenda every day. 
Today, the parliamentary order paper was written by some civil servants having a talk to all the people in the government departments and that's what MPs will be allowed to talk around. Some of us have been very ingenious in finding little pegs to raise the issues we want to, but that's not good enough. Being smart, being a smart aleck isn't the way you should run a democracy. And there's a lot of people who aren't smart alecks mm. in the House of Commons. Uh, it should be, these are the issues that Parliament decide, that the Speaker or a business committee decide. So they're, they're just a, a couple of examples, and there are many, many others of where this sort of informality always works to preserve existing power, doesn't work to preserve or to advance the power of either Parliament or, more importantly, the sovereignty, which doesn't rest with Parliament, but yeah. should rest with the people. Yeah. Let us be explicit about that, as they are in the American Constitution, that power should, re should rest and sovereignty should rest with the American people. So yeah. this isn't but this isn't an anarchic thing. This is like a reg. This is we're the odd ones out. We're the weirdos here in in the UK as usual. That most Western democracies do allow the people to see the rule book, so they can have a sensible debate about the things that need adjustment and need change, uh, rather than as as we do, we're sort of uh, the passive recipients of what happens and the views of certain media commentators about what's good or what isn't good. I want to know, this is, you know, I wouldn't put up with this in my housing cooperative, <laughs> and I would not put up with it in my golf club or whatever thing that you're associated with. I'd want to see that, you know, these are my subs, these are the when the annual meeting is. You know, yeah, I want to know, the the game. how can I elect my Member of Parliament? How can I elect someone in the second chamber? Why can't I? Um, who is this person called the Prime Minister? No statute exists defining the Prime Minister. Mm. It's, a, it's a sort of make-up bit of bobbing and weaving rather than this is who elects the Prime Minister, this is who the powers and duties of a Prime Minister. And indeed, you know, even more pertinent at the moment, I believe in keeping our country together. But some people don't, and that's, that's absolutely fine. And they may win the argument rather than me. But I'd like to see all of us collectively within a federation, within the United Kingdom. Some people would like to see those bits separate. Some people would like to see a form of devolution. All actually very, very valid views. We don't have that argument sensibly. It's sort of botch and pressure. It's like this vessel containing uh, heated water pressing and popping out the rivets everywhere and then you run to where the problem is rather than saying well let's all agree basically not down to the fine detail written constitutions never end an argument mm. they give you a boxing ring in which you can have in a sensible way a discussion maybe that's boxing <laughs> is not a good way to that's a that's a really good image i mean one of the reasons we've always called for a written constitution is is that you know uh, partly we want our we the people moment that you described of us coming together and deciding what we do and don't want but also um, we think it's really really important to set out that we the people set out what the government can and can't do in our name and that it's that that's the power relationship that they are exercising power on our behalf it's not their power um, but one of the things again one, some of the issues that people often raise when we talk about written constitutions they'll often point to different constitutions around the world and they'll say uh, but this constitution does this and it's really bad. So often it will be the American constitution and, and the right to bear arms. Sometimes it will be the Irish constitution and the fact that it, it uh, prevents women from having abortions. Because um, there, there are lots of, it, you know, as you say, most other countries have constitutions. Not all of them are good constitutions. So what would you say to that? Firstly, we will be the first nation ever to write a constitution having involved millions of people. Mm. So it will have an authenticity and a legitimacy that even those documents, we won't have 40 white guys in Philadelphia. I want 10 million founding fathers and mothers to participate in this. So hopefully out of that national debate, there'll be a distillation of the things we can agree on. We won't, I imagine, be prescriptive about very specific things. So in the middle of an existential war between the then 
the United States and Great Britain, um, people put into the Constitution the right to bear arms. Mm -hmm. Wholly understandable, because they were not permitted to bear arms prior to that by the uh, British um, government. Uh, they were meant to just carry on and do their business and there was a worry about uh, what a militia could do. So that made a lot of sense. Should they have put it in there? If they'd have thought, well, we're going to be around in a couple hundred years' time, will that be relevant? Uh, I think even then, some of those people, Madison and Hamilton and Washington and all the people who uh, uh, got that document together, Jefferson and others, uh, would, would maybe theoretically have not put that in. But to have not put something like that in at that time would have been uh, odd because mm. they were in the middle of a period when, you know, a matter of a few years after that document, the British burnt down the White House. Yep. So um, it was to that extent a product of its times. Now, we know better because we've been talking to everybody else about democracy, not the British people, <laughs> but all the people who've been uh, pre uh, sort of uh, colonial or uh, uh, countries around the world that we've had any influence with, and also Europeans in the post war settlement uh, after the end of uh, Nazi Germany. Um, so I think we actually have a great deal of expertise in how we could do this well. Yeah. And we should listen to that expertise. Now, I go back to this point, there'll be a number of things that will not be in a written constitution as a result of a lengthy process that I want in it. And I'm just going to have to swallow that and say, fair dues, I had my chance, I put in to this big consultation, I put my document in there, <laughs> and they didn't actually take every dot and comma. How outrageous is that? I, I hope I will say, it's wonderful that we've, we've decided to do something on an elected second chamber, and uh, the independence of local government in this country as great and I'm glad I've lived so long but there's a lot of other people who made contributions about the way the union should work the way we should work on uh, individual rights etc didn't quite agree with them but you know what mm. I can't say we didn't have the debate I can't say we didn't have the best academics to help draft the papers on request that we didn't have the broadest ever consultation. In fact, what an excitement there should be at the end of that three-year process when loads and loads of people, millions of people, have been involved in this. And they say, God, have you seen what we've produced? Mm. Look at the document. It's fantastic. It is the rule book of our democratic society, and we can, we can own it, and we can argue about it. So, yeah. right to bear arms, boy, is there an argument, quite rightly. Abortion in Ireland, there is an argument, quite rightly. It's not that, I wonder if you can find a peg in which to do it. Well, let's wait till some horrible thing happens, a shooting, or a person has to come to another country to have an abortion for necessary reasons, and there's a publicity about it. Let's have a measured discussion. So democracy for me, yes, it is about accountability. It is about voting, but not all about that mm. there's something really important that adds on if you genuinely have a democracy and that is education and at the moment what is the document we can use to help educate all of us about how our democracy works now and how it could possibly work better what are the processes of amendment for that document yeah. so that we don't get a blockage for 50 years uh, but when there's been enough discussion you can move the thing forward. So education, I think, also demands that we have something that literally every boy and girl at school can carry around in their purse or pocket. I was interested in what you're saying around voting being important but it not being enough. It's one of the things we say a lot, that um, democracy is, process, is a process and not just an event, and that part of the problem is that uh, most people don't have much experience of deliberation in politics, that it's it's seen as quite transactional, of either you get what you want or you don't, mm -hmm. and often if you don't, you walk away. Um, and I think the deliberation around creating a constitution is yeah. really, really important. It's absolutely essential, and I, ha I happen to be one of the people who believes in representative democracy. Mm. I think 
direct consultation, participation, communication has an incredibly important role to pay, play in all that. But I think we've seen in uh, recent times where we've almost converted elections not into the end uh, process, but actually into a one-off event, as mm. you've said. And I think there may be many people on both sides of the argument regretting which way they voted on uh, leaving the European Union. Mm. Uh, and if anyone tells me they thought the, the way in which that was conducted on both sides actually added much to the sum total of human knowledge, I'd be very surprised because I think uh, it was faulty in many ways. But the idea that uh, we just go out and have a random sample effectively or that we just jump into a referendum as a way of uh, running our country on a regular basis. I mean, there will be reason to, to, to do a referendum, I'm sure, but um, part of building up the structure of a democracy is about having some faith in the legitimacy of your representatives and their capability. And I think a lot of that will depend upon having a structure in place that people trust. Yeah. And I don't think that's the case at the moment. So people will say, I don't want those idiots in the House of Commons. They just do what they're told. You know, I was in there for 30 years and every night I could have predicted the, the score. That wasn't, you know, people swayed by the arguments and a great speech was made or uh, we got thousands of emails from one particular pressure group. Mm -hmm. I'm really sorry to disabuse everybody about the truth of that. But the reality was the government and the alternative government own our legislature, not the people, not members of parliament. So until we can break free of that and have a proper parliament, which does its job of holding to account the government, I mean, I'm now making a case <laughs> for a genuine separation of powers in the written yeah. constitution, and I will argue that in front of a citizens' convention. And until we, in my view, until we get that, I think all the other stuff is really window dressing to a degree. Mm. So, you know, I want to put that argument strongly to people and I, I'm sure millions of other people, once they've looked at all the arguments and all the discussions, will say, okay, we've gone through a process and we have now agreed on a number of recommendations we can put forward to the 2022 Parliament, let's say, and we'll have that debate and they will hold the politicians to that promise because I think they'll have generated such excitement. There's such a liberative, liberating effect uh, when you can bring loads and loads of people to bear on an issue and they will want to know how are you going to actually um, make local government independent as it is in most democracies. Okay, well we've thought about this and this is what we came up with. It was changed by the Citizens Convention but this is what we think we've got. So. What would you education <laughs> as well as voting <laughs> absolutely before before you can say you're genuinely democratic what would you say to the people who would argue that you know it's basically not very british that we have you know our political culture has evolved it's been around for hundreds of years it basically works uh, the only reason countries have written constitutions is because they've had some kind of big revolution or big some, some kind of big collapse and they had to set everything up from scratch following mm. that. that. That's not us. So. Well, we, I think we've had a big collapse. I think uh, I've never known people so disparaging about politics and politicians in my 40 years in public life. And I think we're at a point of crisis. And I think um, we've seen that in recent times uh, very, very strongly. The failure of Parliament to stand up for its rights in terms of being consulted on whether we leave the European Union or not. It took Gina Miller to take a case to the Supreme Court, which I had a minor hand in creating uh, in the um, run-up to the, the Blair government. Um, very important things like that. But uh, I think it's, it's not really uh, going to be uh, the way that we can do stuff. We would actually need to have, rather than doing it in a good old British way, the good old British way was imperial, yep. it was very class based, and people were told what to do, and you should know your place. Mm. And they were dragged kicking and screaming through a series of 
uh, Acts of Parliament, which took forever to get there, things that we take for granted now, votes for working people, votes for women, votes for people 18, for example, just looking at the franchise, um, they weren't done because there was a revelation among the, the ruling class, if you like, and let's, let's give these people what they deserve. They were dragged to it. And I think if you've got a document that isn't a British way, it's a democratic way. Certainly highly sensitive to a British democratic culture, which I think we do have, mm. but we don't have the institutions of democracy to match the heartfelt sense that we are a democracy, that we have a British democratic culture, which certainly does exist. I'm not saying it doesn't. So I think you've got to match the institutional framework to the cultural framework, and it has to be something that we all share. If we are to be a modern Britain, rather than backward looking, you know, whether it's the Magna Carta or whether it's the struggles of getting uh, Acts of Parliament about um, kids being up chimneys or down mines or whatever, to actually get it into the modern era and the future era of where we're going when we will be a power which will be overshadowed by China, India, America, etc. as years go by, to actually be a self-starting, uh, uh, assertive, independent Britain within the European Union or not, uh, certainly within Western Europe. To have that, to look for that as a future, can't happen on a sort of let's botch it along and see what happens next next week. It's got to have a view about are, are our citizens equal? Do people in different parts of our union have equal rights politically? Do we still elect people? Do we still select people to sit in the legislature, in the second chamber? Mm. You know, that's not a way for the future. The way for the future is to help define over a period carefully where we want to go and to put it in writing so all of us can share it. Talking of the future, mm. uh, one of the criticisms that people often make is that um, a written constitution actually prevents you from preparing adequately for the future because it, it, you know, it preserves a particular moment in time and uh, it's, you know, it's almost impossible to change constitutions that once they're there, they're done. And um, so actually, if, if you want to be able to evolve, if you, if you want to be able to continue to develop, you, you need to do it without a written constitution. I think um, where people have wanted to have flexibility, uh, you'll find that, or where people have that flexibility, that the, the constitution has been about them and their political power. If you have a citizens' convention creating a constitution or creating a, a debate about whether you should have one or not, uh, I think you'll find that people will decide to have something that it affects everybody. Mm. And also, of course you shouldn't get into minutiae. Of course every principle within a constitution will also have an act of parliament to give you the detail and the act of parliament can be amended the uh, judiciary the supreme court for example in the uk would only come into play if some of the basic principles were being overridden and they they if you had this model mm -hmm. you can have a model without a supreme court by the way you can have as we said here we go again <laughs> in, our, in our document uh, we actually produced one that was just a codification yeah. of where we are now, not even in statute law. So you don't think you have to have politicised elected judges um, to have a written constitution? No, and I think we've had politicised unelected judges for the last two or three hundred years. So I don't have a problem about a judicial branch. Mm. And actually, it's one of the few remaining areas I think where it is fit for purpose there may be certain things I would like to do in terms of evolving its social composition uh, but I think it's so making it more diverse basically more representative. Uh, yeah yeah um, but I don't I don't want to do that tomorrow as it were but I do think they are more effective if you look at them compared to the government is the government currently competent if you can cast any party politics aside, do people think that government is competent, having looked at 
the European Union question. Um, do you think that Parliament is competent in terms of holding government to account, in terms of individual members having the ability to work together to create law on a whole raft of things? Um, or is it actually just there pretty much as a rubber stamp and very self-important and talk a lot, but really producing a lot of guff for 24-hour news mm -hmm. rather than long-term strategic thinking about where we need to be as a British people? What has Parliament done on uh, such social care? Where is the long-term thinking about? I'm not criticising select committees who do their level best, mm. but I am trying to illustrate that Parliament itself would be the greatest beneficiary from its from an independence and a definition, because it couldn't be shut up as Mrs May shut up the select committees by putting a majority of Conservatives on, even though there's not a majority of Conservatives in the House, as we saw with the deal yeah. with the uh, Ulster Unionists, um, the UP. Uh, so um, I think we would be sensible about what we put in the rule book, but we, we you know, wouldn't go into every dot and comma detail. That would be Acts of Parliament. Then there'd be case law. Mm. Uh, then there'd be one hell of a raft of common sense as to how you did stuff. And that would allow all of us to participate in our democracy, to be owners of our own democracy, to be owners of our own society, to be respectful to each other and to work within some broadly defined things about how you elect a prime minister, what your electoral system is, who should decide these things. Um, and I think that is better than a passing majority that can decide in a, a government, in this case, for example, not elected by a majority of people, that suffered a loss of the, its majority at the last mm. election, with one person not elected by the British people, the Prime Minister, not directly elected by the British people, deciding hmm, well, we're going to change the way this works. We're going to stop Parliament from being involved in this decision. Uh, we're going to elect, we're going to impose select committees on that institution the way, we the way I decide, rather than as a broader response to a much more fundamentally legitimate democratic culture. I know we've got a few questions coming in. Um, which is where my eyesight ruins everything. Yeah, I am. <laughs> okay, so I can see uh, Craig Nickel. Can we have a e simple, concrete example of the sort of opportunities that ordinary people would want? Uh, I'm wondering, uh, is that the, maybe the process around the creation of um, a democratic convention. It could perhaps. also be what kind of things they might want in a constitution. Okay. Certainly, obviously, when South Africa did their constitution, the reason it's why it's considered quite so radical is because they put socioeconomic rights in it, so they had things like rights to housing yeah, yeah. and water and healthcare and education. So that, what that you know, that constitution went much further in terms... Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, that, may, that may be what uh, he is asking. So mm -hmm. let me say, firstly, if if it's a, a process question about how people get involved, every individual could be involved online. Every individual could be involved in a multiplicity of ways by the various organisations. They may be members of Unlock Democracy as well as individuals. They may be members of the Conservative Party. That there may be lots of ways in which they can try and influence. The parties, by the way, would obviously put their evidence forward and their views forward. It would be important that they did. It's much more important that they are not dominant in the process, that it's done impartially, that the ring is held by uh, impartial academics. And I trust Professor Robert Blackburn and his team at King's because they did that document. It isn't entitled, you know, here's your new written constitution. It's a big question mark, you know, a new Magna Carta? Well, we've got these <laughs> options, so... It's up to you to decide, yeah. and equally, it's not up to me to decide. Um, in, in terms of uh, the, the point you were talking about, in terms of examples of concrete things uh, within the uh, Constitution, can I say 
I don't think I should be saying, I know you've heard me have some very strong views about where I think reform should happen, as I've spent 30 years locked up in the British equivalent of Robin Island in the House of Commons, uh, and I'm full of passion about the things I care about. I could give you that list of reforms, but I, it's not for me to do that. I will put my evidence in, I guarantee you that but it will count for only as much as other people's evidence. And millions and millions of us need to say there are things we want, rather than uh, Graham Allen's trying to lead this yeah. and he wants everybody to have... That's, that's what we've always said. Ch I mean, Charter 88 always took the position that they were never going to list what they wanted in the Constitution because it wasn't for them to decide. It was about yeah. the people having that conversation. There yeah. might well be groups of things that would be sensible to put in a Constitution, um, but that it was, you know, it was all about the process of people coming together to have that conversation. Absolutely, and I think um, to be flippant, you could put in the constitution the right to free beer for everybody. Yeah. Okay, so we all think no, that wouldn't really be a good thing to do. <laughs> but you could equally say, some may argue, and certainly it's in the uh, draft written constitution for the UK in that big document uh, that you should have all the rights that are in the European Convention on Human Rights, mm. uh, the right to freedom of religion, the, the, the right to uh, assemble, freedom of speech, etc., etc., all, all those mm. obvious ones, yep. if you like. There's also economic and social rights. And I think a, a, a citizens' convention would really have to look at that seriously. What are the economic and social rights, if any, that you want in a constitution? Because you're getting very practical, and it may be that the right to uh, a house may me mean something completely different in a hundred years' time mm. or fifty years' time. Okay, let's have the debate and let's change the constitution if that's the way it works. So, I mean, even something as the right to a motor vehicle, which we might look at at the moment. <laughs> Some of us, you know, sort of ten, twenty years ago, might have said, "Oh yeah, we should all, you know, be able." Have the right to, of mobility. Yeah. Well, that is looks really different now in yeah. the age of shared vehicles, uh, common ownership, uh, mm. different energy uses, etc. I'm delving into a real detail there and probably losing my way a little bit, but I think it's really important that people have their own views, put them forward, and communicate with like-minded people in order to get those things put forward in this immense public debate that we yeah. need to have uh, to to bring us forward towards a citizens convention which will I hope include a written constitution yeah. but if it doesn't I'll be heartbroken but I will accept that's the view of a citizens convention I won't be on it probably yeah. well I doubt, doubt I'd be on it I might, might put my name forward <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think you'd probably get through the selection process. No, possibly not. Possibly don't, don't have enough experience in this field. But, um, <laughs> or possibly too much experience. In yes, field. yeah, pro quite possibly. And I'd understand that yeah. also. But uh, what an exciting thing to be yeah. involved in. Can you remember that night uh, of the uh, referendum in Scotland, which didn't produce independence? Uh, I'm sure people felt very strongly both directions. Some felt they had lost but I hope everybody felt what an incredible level of participation and interaction and that's the way a democracy should work if we can bottle that and have millions and millions of people participating in deciding the future not just for themselves but for their children mm -hmm. about how our democracy works our democracy is under threat and Britain responded by millions of people coming together for a national conversation lasting three years with outcomes which the British Parliament then said yes, no or amend to. Yeah. Wow. And one of the things I think it's really, really important to remember is that this is a very different way of doing politics for the UK, but actually lots of other countries have done similar things. So lots of provinces in Canada have had citizens' assembly on changing the electoral system. The Netherlands has had one. Uh, Ireland's had them. You know, we think of this as something, or some people in the UK yeah, think of this yeah. as something a bit radical and a bit out there, but actually, this is the way other people do politics. And we are the odd ones out, and we can do this. Yeah. There's nothing in the water that means that pe people in Britain are incapable of making this sort of uh, decision. 
uh, an interaction. Um, as far as I can see, also we've got a raft of fantastic people in the field. If we can set this up, if we can get that small amount of money to trigger the beginning of this in practical terms, we've got the pol pol political side signed up. We know roughly where this needs to go. We've got the academics to help on request. Uh, we know how we could select 100 people to be the core group here, but they would just be to stimulate the debate with millions of that. So we, we, we know how to connect with people uh, through social media. So we've got all those elements in place. Also, most importantly, we have lots of fabulous experiments about uh, interaction with communities. Mm. And there's you know too far too many to mention citizen uh, assembly for citizens. Um, the LSE did something recently. We've had other examples. We've had a campaign for electoral reform. Has been doing great great mm. stuff as well. All those, not not one model, all those people should be organising to feed in and help create this tremendous broth and mix of democratic exchange, uh, excitement uh, in the British public that they'll be able to decide their own futures. So that uh, those sorts of assemblies and many others can make that contribution to this. And absolutely no reason we can't do that in this country because everybody else has been able to do it in the democratic world we can do it too and then we'll own our own democracy yep let's see if there's some, I think some other questions coming in right uh scottish independence referendum was amazing first time i felt my vote actually mattered in three decades of voting um suggest that Graham's list of ideas would be useful to kick things off yep. that's very flattering but um, I think the idea a very I mean a, a general list of the things we need to do we pulled that list together and it was the obvious things about um, second chamber role of parliament um, independence for local government the federal or not structure of the UK uh, voting systems and then there was a catch-all at the end that said and anything else that the citizens convention shall so decide yeah uh, so I mean they could knock out some of those first mm. ideas oh, I don't want to get involved in discussion about the second chamber of house Lords. okay that's, that's their mm. call but there would be lots of others I think there'd be, need to be some degree of prioritization uh, and how what came first in terms of the discussion? Do we, did did you want to tackle the question of how do we put all this together in a in a document? That might be one way to start off. It might be you want to actually have a, a sizzling political debate to kick it all off about yeah, get rid of the second chamber. Yeah, but what are we going to do about it? So we had lots of options in our big document, uh, which suggested possible ways to do the second chamber. It might be a key to unlock to a, lot, a number of other things. That wouldn't be for you or me to decide. That would be up to the convention to meet, to commission academics, may I say not just in London, but in the English regions and Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, and indeed internationally, we've had the experience to commission those papers and make a rational decision that, that, that commanded broad support. It's going to take a little time, you know. We're not going to get 100 people in a room and they'll put their hands up, yeah, abolish the House of Lords and set up a PR system for, you know, each region shall have uh, 10 members in the House of Lords, whatever. Yeah. Okay, look, that's that one dealt with, you know. Next one, uh, you know, what are we going to do for independence for local government in mm -hmm. this country? Ah, oh, right, well, uh, I think there should be an act of parliament. We borrowed one Graham Allen wrote. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll put that into law and that's is everybody happy about it won't be like that it'll have to be really careful and studied there can't be a running commentary the 40 white guys in philadelphia that did the um independence of the united states and did their constitution um had the beauty of not having live coverage day to day they were able to say things in the privacy of their mm. own rooms and anti-rooms and over tea no doubt bostonian tea um well 
what do you think about it? Well, I think if you add that one and we gave them so and so and a bit of horse trading going yeah. on, but you know, we, I draw the line at so, oh God, oh, we have to go and have another meeting. I think there's got to be some private space as well, yeah. so that people could it could be ordinary people listening to us talk right now who could be those people, and if they just sit and say, well, I'm only here to get what I want, and if we don't have the Dahunt system of PR for this first chamber, I'm taking my ball home. Oh, don't put your name forward. Let's try and get a consensus. Let's try and compromise and move forward. And you'll be amazed at what we can come up with. But at the end of the day, some decisions will have to be made. And that's where Parliament comes back in and can say uh, yes, no, or amend. You mentioned, obviously, that the, the founding fathers of the American Constitution did it all in private. They, they didn't have the running commentary. Uh, they certainly didn't have 24-hour news coverage. <laughs> um, one of the challenges that always gets put to me when I talk about trying to do a more deliberative kind of politics, a more consensual type of politics, is always that, well, you know, the media will never let it happen. That you'll, you know, you'll just get mocked from day one. That they will encourage, you know, people will not see it as a point because you know newspapers will be telling them, well, it's just an expensive talking show. Yeah, uh, I think the media could be the most fantastic asset to what we're doing, mm -hmm. what we're trying to do here, or it could be, as it has been in a in recent past, um, putting the mockers on stuff because the owners of the the newspapers, in particular, or even the BBC or others see that their role will be changed mm. and oh you know d democracy will mean the people getting involved and finding better ways to be represented and uh understanding their democracy well we thought that was you know i thought nick robinson did that for us <laughs> um or uh, some eminent columnist in the guardian or telegraph surely mm. You know, people can't, haven't got the brains to figure out things for themselves. Well, they have, providing they get some information. So, to be positive about this, I would love the Telegraph and the Guardian, let's say, to pick two ends, if you like, of the spectrum mm -hmm. of the written media, and the BBC, or whoever, to be partners with the convention. And I, when I said the Founding Fathers meeting in private, well, they didn't have telly in those days, <laughs> but... Uh, I'm not suggesting this is all done in private. On the contrary, I think in public session, mm. yeah. you could have people who, in effect, would do some of the things that we did in our big document and read into the record some of the reasons why we should and someone else some of the reasons why we shouldn't. And my proposal is this, and this is why we should do this. So you'd have a debate, and by God, fancy watching that. Mm. Uh, if, it, if it was done properly and carefully and seriously... Uh, you could have, it could almost become popular. Mm. Because how we run ourselves as a democracy, when our democracy currently is under a bigger threat than I've ever known it in the past, I think is a big issue. And I think if it's done right, imagine, let us let me have a fantasy here. Imagine the BBC producing um, material on, on air, uh, graphics, and explanation and eminent people as they would call them explaining particular points of view and what the key decisions will be over the next couple of months on mm. uh, how this works uh, on the role of scotland or wales or where the line has to be drawn on devolution does it include the right to raise funds by the assemblies and parliaments of the constituent parts of the union really interesting issue for a lot of people but it can be put in such a way by the BBC in my example uh, where you and I and ordinary people can enter the debate as well so I think it's actually an incredibly exciting broadcasting and written media opportunity yeah. and more conventionally education in schools if at every primary, secondary and university. Imagine every politics course. Mm. I'm running a politics course at the very moment that we are creating a new constitution that's got to be the best three years of your educator's life <laughs> to be there talking to your own people, mm. your own young people at, at your college or university. 
and saying the debate we've had on this has been so good I've been recording it writing it down it's going to go in yeah. and the thing that we came up with at the end of our discussion we're going to make sure that is put in front of people at the citizens convention how exciting is that one of the things that um, the Citizens Assembly in British Columbia, which was about the electoral system, and that was one of the first kind of the modern Citizens Assemblies. One of the things that they did was they used the member. Well, a they you know they published all the materials online. There were videos, there were documents. There was there was all the kind of the traditional stuff mm -hmm. that you would expect. But they also used the members of the of the assembly, the ordinary members of the public, actually as advocates. There was a whole phase of the assembly where they went back out to their communities, to their region, and they held public meetings. And it wasn't about an academic explaining what the assembly was about. It was about, OK, this is what we have been talking about recently. What Fantastic. do you think? And that, I think, is one of the things, reasons why it made it quite so powerful, because the members of the assembly owned that process. And that's what I think we can do with this kind of thing. Well, uh, you remind me of when we did the big document and um, put it out to consultation. Uh, one of the things that I did as chair of the select committee was to say I offered this fantastic prize of a bottle of House of Commons champagne <laughs> to anyone who could write the best uh, preamble yeah uh, so you know everyone knows we the people you know the, the, the pursuit of life liberty and happiness etc etc uh, and uh, put that out and had some fantastic lyrical passionate mm. positive die for democratic language and um, somebody won the bottle of champagne um, and so presumably it's, it's in there somewhere it's a link, <laughs> it, there's a link from from the big document yeah, yeah. To, to a much smaller there's a compendium of some of those uh, uh, examples of a preamble mm. and you could have chosen I could have chosen uh, any one of you know well, dozens um, so, you know, that will be, for the lyricists and poets amongst us, that will be a great opportunity uh, to express um, their, their views in, in, the, in, the, in the most uh, powerful language uh, we can devise in the English language. So, um, yeah, I think people getting involved. And the idea that we'll all take up positions in trenches mm. and we might win... 51% of the vote and they get 49 so we prevail I don't believe that actually outside of the ludicrously uh, partisan uh, nature of parliament the, that, that does happen uh, that I think people are much more sensible and I think people will discuss and negotiate with each other and consult and find something that's workable and something that is appealing uh, because that's why they want to do it that's why they, they're involved and that's why they've, they've got, had the most fantastic education that most of us will never have uh, with how this thing should move forward. So I am incredibly optimistic if, if there's that attitude, if we get loads and loads of people involved in lots of different participative mechanisms, and if we get a media level, uh, both printed media and televisual media mm. uh, engagement, that people will do their level best. You know, these, these are people that can make snooker popular. Uh, <laughs> imagine being able to talk about the, the most exciting things in our democratic world and Britain's role. Uh, yeah, it's falling any, off any a lot. Any defences of snooker can go direct to Sorry Graham on Twitter. I like snooker. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got a couple more questions. Yeah, I could read them. Yep. We must abolish the BBC first. Oh. Uh, Faye, that's uh, you're giving up already. Don't uh, the, the, uh, BBC run by the people would appeal to many? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Let, I think the public ownership or not, and the former ownership of the BBC uh, comes after a big picture commitment that there should be free uh, interaction of media and the people, or some such phrase. But. That's up to you guys to decide that, not me. Uh, but I think then how you actually regulate would have to be something that would take place in, in Acts of Parliament. But the right to free speech does not include the right to shout fire in a crowded theatre. Uh, but it does mean that sometimes what other people say has to be respected as well as the, what we say. So 
those what a great debate that's going to be uh, over mm. weeks and weeks and an informed debate and it will be on TV and it will be in the papers so and it will have an outcome fantastic debate because you know at the end of this process it's going to go before Parliament in 2022 Pew. you'd better treat this seriously uh, and people who don't treat it seriously, woe betide them. Because if you don't make your point effectively, if you happen to be a, a billionaire newspaper owner, and you can't justify why you should own a newspaper, and then uh, a thousand journalists can't own their newspaper, uh, people will draw their own conclusions about that. Um, so the fine detail, the finer detail, isn't going to be in the Constitution. The idea that there should be the right to free speech and that the media should be free and that we should at some point have a free press in this country uh, I think are very powerful uh, big picture things that could appear in the constitution but um, that's not for me to decide thank goodness that's going to be the citizens convention after three years very serious uh, deliberation deciding whether that's important or not and on that note, we're going to need to bring this to a close, but we will be putting links to um, the Magna Carta report that Graham's been mentioning on our, um, on our website and on our Facebook page. And if you do want to get more involved with campaigning for um, a written constitution, then follow Graham on Twitter and obviously join our Not Democracy because that's what we exist to do. So thank you very much, everybody, and thank you, Graham. My pleasure, and uh, let's do it.